You know, being an immigrant, people will ask me weird competition questions all the time, right? Uh, my favorite one that I get that people always ask me is people come up and they go, Chris, you're from India. Which country do you like better, India or America? Huh? Which country do you like better, huh? India or America? Fuck, I don't know, Canada. <laughs> You know how they say there are no stupid questions? Well, I found one. That's a fucking stupid question. They're two completely different countries. They have completely different philosophies, completely different ways of life. They are similar in certain respects, but they're very different. Which one's better? That's not the question you need to be asking. It's a dumb question. It gets us nowhere, right? India and America have a lot of great things going for them. We talked about some of the awesome things that India's got going on, right? And so does America. America has a lot of cool shit going on in this country, right? But there's, it's not, neither country is without its problems. You know, America's got something amazing. America's got the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, incredible documents that the world had never seen before they were written. You know, the Constitution is amazing. I'd give it a B minus. <laughs> <laughs> if you included black people and women, I'd give it a B plus. <laughs> you still don't know how to use commas properly, right? <laughs> <laughs> The Bill of Rights is amazing. Some of the some of the things in the Bill of Rights had never been said before in any country. A lot of countries adopted some of the things in the Constitution and Bill of Rights into their own, India being one of them. India has taken the idea of being a secular nation and adopted it into their constitution. That's amazing, you know? The First Amendment in this country is one of the most incredible things that we actually have. The freedom of speech, that's amazing. You understand that I can go all around this country, no matter where I go, as an immigrant, I can get on stage and through a microphone, through a sound system, criticize the state of this country, criticize capitalism, and express my thoughts and opinions on how we think I think we might be able to better ourselves, and that is my right to do in this country. And the, yeah. And the people that disagree with me threaten to decapitate me, and that is also their rights. <laughs> the limit is acting on it. You know, you can't act on it. Just because you want to shoot me, you can't do Just because you say you want to shoot me, you can't actually do it, right? Just because you have a second amendment doesn't mean it trumps the first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Third Amendment is an incredible amendment, too. The Third Amendment makes sure that, uh, that the military can't just occupy and live in your house. Yeah, if we didn't have the, the, the Third Amendment, we would just be dealing with John Kelly and John Bolton in our fucking living room every single day. <laughs> <laughs> just eating a bowl of oatmeal every morning. Right? Getting fucking oatmeal crusties in his oh, war yeah. criminal mustache. <laughs> Constantly bitching about taking down Iran and Venezuela. <laughs> Like, hey, uh, Johns, <laughs> you guys want to start, like, maybe paying the rent? <laughs> like, let me tell you how that socialist is doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. A lot of, like, but America's not without its problems, right? There's a lot of problems in America right now. There's hundreds and thousands of people in this country that don't have health care. That's ridiculous. The richest country in the world can't afford to take care of their sick people? That's not great. That's not awesome, right? We need to start doing that. We need to start looking at our sick and taking care of them. We can't have this thing where you go to a hospital and then have to worry about paying that shit off for the rest of your life, right? And the people get mad at me when I bring this shit up. People get very upset, you know? People look at me and they go, Chris, what about Pfizer? Huh? And Purdue Pharmaceuticals. What about them. They need more helicopters. Have you thought about the bottom line? <laughs> That's the problem with this debate about health care in our country, isn't it? It's about the cost of human life. How much is that worth? We just put a price tag on our bodies. That's what we did. We put a fucking price tag in our bodies, and Pfizer is talking about its bottom fucking line. That's a problem in this country. You know, it's a major problem in this country. India tried privatizing their health care and immediately decided that they're not going to do it anymore. Right? When I was growing up, I never had to worry about hospital bills. Like My family never had to worry about doctor's bills or anything like that. When we got sick, right, you go to the doctor and you get a little bill that you can pay off. It's not an extraordinary amount of bill. And it was like, I literally went to somebody's like house. They had turned like a portion of their house into a clinic. 
That's what it was to go to a doctor in India. It was amazing, right? So you can either go to these people and get what you need to get in order to take care of your health or uh, die. Those are your options. <laughs> and India's like, we got a billion people, it's fine. <laughs> you know? That's what we think about healthcare is in our society. It's a major problem in this, in this country, right? We're not without them. I think the one problem that both India and America have, these, and this is a problem that, that not a lot of people are addressing, uh, is a problem with class. We have a class problem in this country, right? Both countries do. You know, the difference is that it's out in the open in India and we don't really talk about it in America. Because in America, we believe we have three different classes, right? We have the upper class, which is like all of the rich people up at the top, and then we have like the middle class, which is kind of like Sasquatch. <laughs> some people have heard about it. You know? <laughs> We've seen some blurry photographs, but we're not sure if it ever existed. <laughs> And then you have the lower class, which is all the poor people in this country, right? India's got a, a, its own class system. Uh, it's called the caste system, right? The caste system has five different levels. There's a little bit more complicated version of it, but that's like thousands of levels. We've got to uh, make sure to get drunk later. So um, <laughs> we're going to stick with the top five, right? And all the way at the, at the top of, of this system uh, are the Brahmins, the priests, the people that can communicate to God. They are at the top of the caste system, and they have to be at the top because God is like way the heaven up there. So, <laughs> it was a giggle to the appropriate response for that joke. <laughs> Below that, you have your kings and your politicians, right? That's tier number two, kings and politicians. Underneath that are administrators and warriors. <laughs> That is a military general and a receptionist, just <laughs> even keel. <laughs> that means that every time you go to a doctor's office, you look at the receptionist and say, thank you for your service. <laughs> That's what that means. Underneath that are, are your merchants, right? Your, your blacksmiths, your artists, your working class people. You know all the people that Bruce Springsteen pretends to sing about? <laughs> Oh, that's a dangerous joke, isn't it? <laughs> Come on, guys. Let's be honest with ourselves. Bruce Springsteen is not for the people. You know, he calls himself the boss. <laughs> if he was really one of us, he'd call himself the fucking proletariat. <laughs> he'd be out there striking with those workers. That's what he'd be doing, you know? Yeah, look, all I'm trying to say is his mansion has gates. So, <laughs> yeah. And then underneath all of this, the very bottom, some people don't consider these people a class of people, right? All at the very bottom are the untouchables. Yeah, that's not a cute nickname I made up. It's literally what we can't do to them. That's how good at classism India's gotten over the last 10,000 years, as we fucking perfected it, where we invented a class of people where we're like, you're so poor that we don't want to touch you, so it runs off on us. <laughs> like a shitty watercolor painting. <laughs> yeah. You can't touch them in that society. Let's not pretend America doesn't have the untouchables in our society either. We have homeless people here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many of you guys will donate to homeless people? Anybody donate? A couple of you guys? Yeah. I mean, anybody actually stay and talk to them for a few minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of you guys will do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot of places, you know. Like, I've, I've talked to a whole bunch of people. Some people stay silent throughout the whole thing. Homeless people are the untouchables of this society. Nobody wants to take care of them. Every, everybody gets in, into an argument, right? Religious institutions definitely don't want to take care of them, right? Go past any church. Every time I pass a church, I look at that and I go, how many homeless people do you think could fit in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's the least Christian thing you could probably do, you know. I get worried about homeless people, you know, people always, whenever I see homeless people, I, I, if I don't have cash, I try to give them food, right, and whenever I grab something out of my car to give, uh, give to the homeless person on the side of the road, I'm like, hey, do you have like a nut allergy or a gluten intolerance? <laughs> and they just look at me and they go, I'm hungry and I'm homeless. Good point. Here's some sandwiches, right? That's, people get upset when I do that, though. 
My friends chastise me for donating to the homeless, right? Talking to them and, you know, figuring out what they need. So my friends got, yeah, one of my friends got mad at me. He's like, why are you giving them money? You don't have a lot of money. I was like, yeah, you're right. I don't. I'm broke, but I got a little bit more than them. And he's like, yeah, but if you keep giving away your money, eventually you might be homeless. I'm like, yeah. And at that point, I hope that guy gives me a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> we do this in our society. We have the same caste system in American society that India has. We just do it with work. You know, We judge people based on labor. Jobs are not treated equally in this country, right? Some people have two, three, four jobs in this country, and none of them are treated equally, right? You know, you don't treat the fast food worker at the same at the same capacity and the same respect as a civil engineer, right? Like we look at the shitty things we say to fast food employees. You, I mean, how fucking hard is it for you to take a goddamn burger order? We don't do that with civil engineers, right? We don't sit there and go, how fucking hard is it to maintain the infrastructure of a growing economy? What the fuck? <laughs> we just don't do that. Even my job, like, people don't consider this a real job. You know, they don't. They don't realize what goes into making all of this stuff happen. You know? They don't consider it a real job. Some comedians don't even consider me a real comedian because of the shit that I talk about. It's all classism. That's all it is. We've played into it. The problem is, this country was kind of founded on it. This country was built on it, and we just don't realize that, right? Yeah. Our founding fathers, a lot of people talk about the founding fathers. They don't really, they never really cared about us. Not a, well, most of them never really cared about us, right? We always tout the like, Constitutional Convention and all that shit. Alexander Hamilton hated us. <laughs> he fucking hated us, right? And now we have like a play on Broadway that no poor person can go see, so. <laughs> Hamilton is quoted to say that the voice of the people has been said to be the voice of God, and however generally this maxim has been quoted and believed, it is not true. The people are turbulent and changing. They seldom judge or determine right. Give therefore to the first class a distinct, permanent share in the government. He's advocating for a king after the Revolutionary War. <laughs> yeah, they didn't invent history books until 1788. <laughs> he advocated for a king at the Constitutional Convention when everybody else was trying to figure out how to run an independent country. And everybody looked at Alexander Hamilton and was just like, Hey, Alex, you shut the fuck up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Who invited you to this? <laughs> Who told you about this? Was it Ben Franklin? That syphilitic motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Give therefore to the first class. He wanted rich people to be in charge of this country because he thought poor people were too stupid to run their own democracy. That's basically what he said. And we can still see some of that shit today, right? The, the people in, in the government are not poor people. They're not working class people. There's a few of them in there now, but there's not a whole lot in there. You know, none of those striking people out there can run for office because it costs too much fucking money to do it. You can't do it. You can't be flipping burgers by day and making presidential speeches by the end of the night. You know, you just can't do it. It takes so much money to actually run a campaign, right? That's why rich people get involved into it. And then they want to legislate for poor people. They don't know fucking know our struggles. They don't know what we have to go through. They've never eaten a cheese and ketchup sandwich. <laughs> James Madison was a little bit trickier, right? James Madison, the way that he wanted to kind of hold us back uh, and make sure that we don't come together, he, he wanted to make this country massive, huge, right? James Madison is quoted to say uh, that it will be more difficult for all who feel it to discover their own strength and to act in unison. Yeah. He kind of succeeded in that, doesn't he? Advocating for a large republic. That's why we had the Louisiana Purchase. That's why we had to go to war over Mexico for no reason. That's why we had to get rid of the indigenous people. Right? We had to go from coast to fucking depressing coast. <laughs> That's what we had to do. You know? And we did it. Look how big this fucking country is. It's huge. 
Last year I went on a cross country uh, a tour with, with my wife and it took us four months to go all the way across and back. It's a, it's a lot of land to cover, you know, to see it properly. So let's not just talk about this whole country. Let's just talk about some states. Texas, 14 hours to cross. Yeah. And one side of Texas does not look like the other. <laughs> yeah. My state, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from, is, takes five hours to get across. And it's completely different on one side to the other, right? You have Pittsburgh, which is a, a blue-collar town. Proud people that built that city with their bare hands and are ready to fight for the people that built their city, to fight for the people that are there. And then you have Philadelphia, too close to New Jersey. <laughs> Even the way we speak in this country shows us how divided we are. You know, shows us that James Madison got to prove his fucking point. You know, like look at the, just the term you guys, right? You guys, there's so many different ways to say it. In the Appalachian region, which is where I'm from, it's yins. It's a fucking travesty to Queen's English, okay? I'm putting out a ballot initiative to get a band. And then if you go further south, it's y'all, right? And then in certain parts of the country, it's just, hey, look at these motherfuckers over there. <laughs> it's all kind of the same. It all means the same. I advocated for this huge republic, and he kind of fucking did it. But there is, there is a little bit of a glimmer of hope, because we have the internet, right? The internet is this amazing tool to help us communicate with each other. You know, we can talk to somebody from halfway around the world, get stories from different parts of the world, try to gain a little bit more perspective. And that's why it's very important for them to control the internet. To make sure we get to see what we get to see. To make sure that whatever you're putting out online, they know about so they can control what you need to see. That's why we need to have more data rights. That's why we need to take control of the one thing right now that technologically advanced us as a species and could probably help the human consciousness to get over this fucking ideal of profit. <sighs> that was a big one. <laughs> yeah. It's not all gloom and doom, right? I can feel the air in the room. <laughs> some of you guys are looking up Pfizer to see if they can drone deliver some Xanax to you guys. Right? <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a couple founding fathers that were, that were on our side, right? George Washington, for example, he was on our side. He didn't want to have some sort of permanent share. He, he wanted four years, four years for every elected leader. Four years, you change it up. If the, if the last guy fucked it up, then you got the next four, you can make it right. And the next four, maybe you can move forward from that, right? He trusted us. He trusted us to do something like that. You know? George Washington advocated for that and then came out and said, hey, if you vote for me to be your first president of the United States, I will guarantee you, I will promise you that for four years, I will make sure that Alexander Hamilton shuts the fuck up. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson was probably the one person that was on our side the most, you know? Jefferson was always on the side of the people wanting to fight for their rights, you know? Jefferson is, uh, at one point, he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to the Constitutional Convention because they were having all these rebellions happen in the countries, right? Veterans weren't getting paid, so they were pissed off. They, uh, you know, freed a bunch of debt prisoners. A lot of rich people got nervous, you know? <laughs> And Jeff Jefferson is quoted to say, I hold it that a little rebellion is a good thing. It is necessary medicine for the health of a government. God forbid that we sh should ever be 20 years without such rebellion. The tree of liberty must be refreshed by the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is natural manure. Yeah. That means we're going to lose a few, but it's going to be worth it. <laughs> He's talking about a revolution. Look, a revolution doesn't have to be violent. That's how this country started. This country started with a violent revolution. But we are 300 years into this country. Have we not outgrown that violent tendency yet? There are different ways to have a revolution. This is a fucking revolution. You guys are still in this room, and we haven't laughed in eight minutes. <laughs> you understand? This is a revolution. Talking about it is a revolution. 
That's what it is. Opening people's minds up, getting to see the different side of an argument, talking to each other is, is the, one of the biggest revolutions that we can do, right? You know, that's what we should be using the internet for. I talk to conservatives all the time. In fact, over the last like four or five years, I've had more conservatives show up to my shows and say, well, I, I never thought about it that way. You know, and, I, and my response is, yeah, well, tell me how you thought about it. Let me learn from you. Let me see where you're coming from. Maybe you've got something going on. You know, what, what questions haven't I answered? What fears haven't I quelled for you? That is a revolution. Mm -hmm. That's what we need more of. That's what Jefferson advocated for. He sent that letter to the Constitutional Convention, and the rest of the founding fathers that were there read that letter and penned a letter back to him. And it just said, hey, Jefferson, uh, shut the fuck up, bro. <laughs> Don't you have some fucking slaves to fuck or something? What are you doing? <laughs> you can't just keep hanging out with Ben Franklin. That syphilitic son of a bitch. <laughs>